to uh, have our guest, Viet Thanh Nguyen. Uh, we are thrilled uh, that he is visiting our campus to give a talk and a reading tonight and has generously uh, agreed to uh, sign books for us and answer questions after. I'm Dr. Maria Carafillis. I'm a professor in the Department of English and director of the American Communities Program, which is an initiative that's jointly funded by Cal State LA and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we are devoted to the study and examination of American studies and communities. I want to thank our co-sponsors for tonight's event, without whom it would not be possible. And uh, this event really brought together a lot of folks from across campus, which makes it a particularly special event. So in addition to the American Communities Program, I want to thank the College of Arts and Letters, the Cross-Cultural Centers, and Dr. Fred Smith, the director of the Cross-Cultural Centers, was just up here before me, the Center for the Study of Genders and Sexualities, the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies, Octavio Villalpando, the Vice Provost, and his Office for Diversity and Engaged Learning, and, as, and finally, the MFA Program in Creative Writing and the Literary Arts. So thanks to all of our co-sponsors, uh, and uh, I would like to uh, as well announce that the ACP has a number of other events coming up for the rest of the semester. Two linked events on the midterm elections, one uh, examining the midterms in a transnational context, the other with a focus on very local policies and impact. Uh, you will find ACP calendars on the back table. You can also find it on our website. And if you haven't already, please like us on Facebook where you'll get updates on all of our events, as well as information on other happenings in Los Angeles relevant to our mission. Uh, and so please take a second to do that when you have a chance. And finally, I would now like to introduce Alex Espinoza, who is also a professor in the English department, who is going to give a, a more formal introduction to our guest, Viet Thanh Nguyen. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. It's so great to look out into the audience and see so many people here um, on, a, on a Thursday night. Uh, coming out to see uh, a writer, um, I think it, it's, it's equally important now uh, more than ever um, that we uh, listen to stories, that we um, uh, learn to embrace each other's differences. Um, it's such an honor to be here introducing Viet Thanh Nguyen. Viet Thanh Nguyen's novel, The Sympathizer, is a New York Times bestseller and won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Other honors include the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, the Edgar Award for Best First Novel from the Mystery Writers of America, the Andrew Carnegie Mellon for Excellence in Fiction uh, from the American Library Association, and the First Novel Prize from the Center for Fiction, a gold medal in First Fiction from the California Book Award, and the Asian Pacific American Literature Award from the Asian Pacific American Librarian Association. His other books are Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, which is a finalist for the National Book Award in Nonfiction and the National Book Critics Circle Award for General Nonfiction, and Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America. He is a university professor, the Errol Arnold Chair of English, and a professor of English, American Studies and Ethnicity, and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. Viet has been interviewed by Tavis Smiley, Charlie Rose, Seth Myers, and Terry Gross, among many others. His current book is the best-selling short story collection, The Refugees, and most recently, he's been the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim and the MacArthur Foundation, and my French is really bad. Le Prix du Meilleur Livre Etranger? Is that close? Okay. Uh, best foreign book in France uh, for The Sympathizer. He is a critic at large for the Los Angeles Times and a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. Now, I personally first met Viet at the LA Times Festival of Books, where I had the opportunity to moderate a panel he was on, and it was his first literary event, right? This was before Viet became Viet. So, <laughs> and I recall uh, reading an advanced copy of The Sympathizer. Uh, the book had just come out. So this was way before his prizes and awards, and I'm happy to say that the Viet back then is the same Viet that we see here now. Uh, he has remained ever gracious, kind, and humble with his time and his energy. 
And it's one of the things about him that I like so very much. Plus, he's a very sharp dresser, too. <laughs> of the sympathizer, the Washington Post wrote, transcending these historical moments, Nguyen Plum's the loneliness of human life, the cost of fraternity, and the tragic limits of our sympathy. The Guardian wrote, the sympathizer is an excellent literary novel, and one that ends with unsettling present day resonance in a refugee boat where opposing ideas about intentions, actions, and their consequences take stark and resilient human form. The Los Angeles Times wrote of the refugees, his collection of short stories is wistful, or wistful threads through the refugees like an anthem of displacement. The text is barred with subtle humor that is wry and painful. The resulting stories are beautiful in their astringency and shifting points of view but no reader will set them down feeling jolly. Gwen's writing travels along the spine of moral reckoning. And NPR praised the refugees as an urgent, wonderful collection that proves that fiction can be more than mere storytelling. It can bear witness to the lives of people who we can't afford to forget. No other writer I know has been able to effectively capture the complexity and nuances of the immigrant experience better than Viet. His work shines an incandescent light on the layered and complex negotiations irrevocably tied to race, nation, and history. His work is all the more necessary and important now, as we find ourselves living in a time in our nation's history, rampant with xenophobia, as we become increasingly intolerant of difference and otherness. Thankfully, we have writers in this world like Viet Thanh Nguyen, writers whose words provide us with hope and remind us that there are ties that bind us all. Please join me in welcoming Viet Tan Nguyen. Thank you, Dr. Karen Felix, for having me here. Thank you, Cal State LA, for being here tonight. Woo! I'm going to do what I always do at one of these events. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm Asian. <laughs> Besides being Asian, one of the things that I am is, as Alex said, a uh, refugee. And it feels sometimes, actually it feels very weird often to say that because looking at me, it's clearly the case that I've made that change from refugee to bourgeoisie. <laughs> <laughs> camps to clubs. I could invite to all kinds of clubs that never even knew existed before the Pulitzer Prize. So why do I go around calling myself a refugee when I clearly don't look like one anymore? I have to tell you a little bit about my life story, which is that I came here to the United States in 1975 when I was four years old. And of course the reason I came here was because of something called the Vietnam War. My parents happened to be on the losing side, and in 1975, we became refugees and came to this country along with 130,000 other South Vietnamese refugees. And we were put into one of four refugee camps set up to hold us, and our camp happened to be Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. And in order to leave one of these refugee camps, you had to have a sponsor to take you out. And in my family's case, there was no sponsor willing to take all four of us. So one sponsor took my parents, one sponsor took my 10-year-old brother, and one sponsor took four-year-old me. So my first memories are from that refugee camp, and more specifically of being taken away from my parents. And I think I spent decades of my life acknowledging that this happened, but not really suppressing the feelings of what this actually meant. Because to confront those feelings would have been too painful. So, I have a five-year-old son, and he turned four last year, same age as I was when I was taken away from my parents. And looking at him at that time made me think back to who I was when I was four years old, and think back also to my parents, and to understand better how I must have felt when I was four, and how my parents must have felt having their child taken away from me. Because what I remember was screaming and howling 
being taken away from my parents. So when I see stories of children being taken away from their parents at the border, it doesn't matter to me that they are undocumented or that their parents are undocumented. We can have a reasonable debate about our nation's immigration policies and our laws, but we shouldn't be having a debate about taking children away from their parents. So I was taken away from my parents only for a few months, and I still remember that experience, and it's still been imprinted on me even 40 years later. So I can imagine what it's like for parents and their children to be separated for months at a time, years at a time, maybe without even the prospect of seeing each other again, because at least my parents knew they would see me again. I didn't know that at four years old, but they did. My brother uh, was actually taken away from my parents, he was 10 years old, for two years. It was two years before he came back. And so he says to me, that's how we know mom and dad loved you more. <laughs> because they couldn't bear being taken away from cute little me for more than a few months. <laughs> Don't feel too bad for him. Seven years later, he went to Harvard. <laughs> and then to Stanford. Which is what you're supposed to do when you're Asian. Everything else is like getting the Asian F, otherwise known as the B+. Plus. <laughs> which I've got quite a few B pluses in my life. <laughs> But I don't want you to think it was all bad being a refugee. Being a refugee gave me the requisite emotional damage necessary to become a writer. <laughs> I tried my best to pass that damage along to my son. <laughs> so he's five years old, and like most five-year-old boys, he loves Legos. But you know, if you're a parent, you can't give your kid everything they ask for. So I have to say no sometimes. No, you can't get these Legos. And then I ask him, do you know why you're not going to get these Legos? And he says, because you're a refugee? <laughs> and I say, that's right. <laughs> I want him to know that both of his parents are refugees. And I want him to know that all four of his grandparents are refugees. Because we live in a country in which to be a refugee is to be stigmatized. We also live in a country in which people don't really clearly understand the distinction between refugees and immigrants, but when they hear the word refugees, they know that that is not a good thing to be, or not a good kind of person to have living in our country. Yet we live in a time in which the United Nations says that there are about 66 million displaced people in this world, which is about the size of France. And about 22 million or so of those people are officially classified as refugees. So it's a huge crisis. It's going to get worse. And obviously, we live at a time, we live in a place where refugees are unwanted in this country. And we're not unique. That's true for many other countries as well. And refugees who come here know this. So recently, I went to Boise, Idaho, and gave a talk at a high school with a program specifically devoted to refugee students from all over the world. And I was told in advance, these will be refugee students listening to you. So I got up in front of them and I asked them, how many of you are refugees? And nobody raised their hands. So then I asked them, how many of you are immigrants? And they started raising their hands. So they already knew, being in this country a few months or a year or two, that there was something wrong with being a refugee. And that it was easier to call themselves immigrants. So that's why even though I don't look like a refugee, I still call myself a refugee because that's who I was and maybe who I still am because that experience of that four-year-old is still imprinted on me somewhere behind my shoulder blades. And so it's crucial that those of us who are refugees call ourselves refugees and say so in public. It's crucial that those of us who are refugees and who have been unwanted stand up for other refugees and other unwanted people. And that's true for those of us who are immigrants as well. Because we're living in a time in which being an immigrant is under attack as well. Now that may, say, that may seem strange to many of us because ostensibly we live in an immigrant country. That's under attack. To be an immigrant in this country for a large part of our history and still today for many people, but not everybody, 
has been a part of the American dream. But to be a refugee is not to be a part of the American dream. So some of those Vietnamese refugees who came here in 1975 ended up settling in Louisiana. And 40 years later, something called Hurricane Katrina happened. Tens of thousands of people were displaced. And some of the American media who covered these displaced people called them refugees. And President George Bush said, it's un-American to call these people refugees. And for perhaps the only time in history, Jesse Jackson agreed with him. <laughs> A lot of these people who were displaced were African Americans, and Jesse Jackson said, it's racist to call African Americans refugees. I thought, great, we refugees have succeeded in bringing America together in hating us. <laughs> but to be an immigrant is still to be a part of the American dream. Even people today who oppose immigrants will still acknowledge that immigrants have been a part of this country's history and that of course immigrants want to come to this country because we're awesome. But refugees are completely different now. And I think refugees are frightening to a lot of people because they are unwanted where they come from. And they bring with them that contamination, but they also bring with them the contamination of what it is that turned them into refugees. To be a refugee means that you have come from a country that has been broken, from a state that no longer can take care of you. And the American dream cannot acknowledge that possibility. We cannot be a country that produces refugees. Unless, of course, you think of Puerto Rico, for example. So it's not that we can't produce refugees, we just cannot believe that we can produce refugees. And there's even more reason, then, for us to disavow, to deny, to push away refugees from our countries, from our borders, preventing them from being our neighbors. What bothers me especially is that even some former refugees will take this position. There are some former Vietnamese refugees who say we shouldn't take in any more refugees from Syria, for example, or the Middle East, or God forbid, Central America. We were refugees, but we were the good refugees. These new people, they're the bad refugees. Well, I grew up in San Jose, California, in a Vietnamese refugee community in the 1970s and 1980s, and let me tell you something. There were a lot of bad Vietnamese refugees <laughs> back then. Insurance scams, welfare fraud, cash under the table economies. We did all of that. And we invented the home invasion. We did a lot of bad things. But somehow all of that has been forgotten by the Vietnamese refugees and by the Americans. Because people forget that in 1975, when these 130,000 Vietnamese refugees came to this country, along with a lot of other refugees from Laos and Cambodia who were also involved in the Vietnam War, the majority of Americans did not want to accept these refugees. And it was only through an act of Congress that we were legally allowed in. Now all of that has been forgotten. We're held up as the example of the good refugees that this country wants. And so many former refugees accept that. We were the good refugees, those are the bad refugees, we shouldn't take them in. But even that idea of good and bad refugees is problematic. These bad refugees, these so-called bad refugees, the ones who are gonna bring, bring trouble, what makes them bad? What made them bad in the case of Vietnamese refugees? Where did these Vietnamese refugees learn how to cheat the economy? Perhaps it was because the United States was in Vietnam for 20 years corrupting the economy with American aid and running in a war by the American program. Where did these young Vietnamese men who became gangsters learn how to do their home invasions? Perhaps it was because they grew up watching what the war had done to their fathers and their brothers and their uncles who had gone to war. Perhaps they had grown up actually watching the war themselves as children. And these so-called good refugees, the ones who became doctors and lawyers and pharmacists and nurses and engineers and so on, what good have they done? It's great that they've become these upstanding citizens. 
But what good have they done for anybody besides themselves and their families? So I resist this dichotomy of good and bad refugees. Because the very narrative of good and bad refugees that we are now using means that we are putting forth, this current administration is putting forth the idea that we only want the good ones to come here. And by that, the administration really means the exceptional ones, right? People like me, Pulitzer Prize winners. You can't base an immigration policy on Pulitzer Prize winners. You get like one a year. I think that's the intent. Well, I for one, believe in an America in which equality means the equal right to be mediocre, just like every other American. That's the country I want to live in. But there's, a, there's another problem with this idea of superiority or merit, that we only want the good ones to come here, because the good ones will pursue the American dream and will help build this country. We might take those people who have not taken the bad refugees. That's a lie. That's a lie. I'll give you an example from my own personal family history. So my parents moved from 1978 from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to San Jose, California. Thank God. <laughs> and they opened perhaps the second Vietnamese grocery store in San Jose. Which is what you're supposed to do as an immigrant or a refugee. And I remember when I was about 10 or 11 years old, walking down the street from my parents' store and seeing a sign in another window that said, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese. At 10 or 11 years old, I didn't fully understand the implications of that sign. But the thought did cross my mind. Does the person who put this sign in this store window know that my parents work 14 hour days every day of the week, almost every day of the year in this store? Does this person know that my parents were shot in this store on Christmas Eve? Does this person know anything about my parents and what they've been through? to get to this country and to become the people that they are. And of course that person did. My parents were not human to the person who wrote those nine words and put that sign in the window. That, my, to, my, to that person, my parents were simply Vietnamese, which meant they were less than human. And I absorbed that. I absorbed that. I'm going to read to you a little bit from a book called Nothing Ever Dies, where I tried to make sense of all of that as an adult, as an academic, as a professor, more than 30 years after the fact. As a gook, in the eyes of some, I can testify that being remembered as the other is a dismembering experience, what we can call a disremembering. Disremembering is not simply the failure to remember. Disremembering is the unethical and paradoxical mode of forgetting at the same time as remembering. Or from the perspective of the other who is disremembered of being simultaneously seen and not seen. And that was what was happening. We were not forgotten, we who were Vietnamese. We were seen. The person who wrote that sign and put it, that sign in the store window saw my parents. But he saw, or he or she, saw right through them at the same time. That's what it means to be dismembered and disremembered in this country as an immigrant, as a refugee, as a minority of whatever kind, as an other. You're not forgotten. You're remembered and disremembered at the same time. So that lent a feeling to me, even as a young person, that was embedded in me which I couldn't fully understand. So for example, eventually I would go on to this very elite high school in San Jose, primarily a white high school. But there were a handful of us who were of Asian descent. And we knew we were different. We just didn't know how. But every day, we would gather in a corner of the campus, and we would call ourselves the Asian Invasion. <laughs> Strangely enough, last year I was invited back to that campus to give a talk to all 1,600 students 
looked out at the audience like this, and I realized we really have taken over. <laughs> That's a different story. Asian invasion. Asian invasion. We were 14, 15, 16 years old. Uh, safe to say, we did not have a historical understanding of Asian invasions. But somehow, that racist idea had, a, had, had, had been placed in our heads. And of course, it's associated with all the wars that the United States has fought in Asia. Now, my particular war is what we call the Vietnam War here. And I've spent much of my life trying to make sense out of that war and out of the implications of that war for Americans and for Vietnamese people, both the Vietnamese in Vietnam and the Vietnamese overseas, especially here in the United States. And for me, it's very difficult to understand that war separate from the refugee experience. Because, of course, for refugees, their flight is completely tied up with things like war. So when I wrote my novel, The Sympathizer, I wrote it as a spy novel, but also as a war novel, but also as a refugee novel. So for those of you who haven't read The Sympathizer, shame on you. I'll summarize the plot for you right now. It's about a communist spy in the South Vietnamese army. April 1975, when Saigon falls or is liberated, depending on your point of view, his mission is to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States, where his job is to spy on their efforts to take their country back. And in order to do that, he has to become a refugee. So in this brief bit that I'm going to read, it's set in another refugee camp, the much more glamorous refugee camp of Camp Pendleton in San Diego. And here he's writing a letter to his aunt in Paris explaining what life is like in a refugee camp, which seems relevant to read now. If allowed to stay together, I told my aunt, we could have incorporated ourselves into a respectably sized, self-sufficient colony, a pimple on the buttocks of the American body politic, <laughs> sufficiently collective to elect our own representative to the Congress and have a voice in our America, a little Saigon as delightful, delirious, and dysfunctional as the original, <laughs> which was exactly why we were not allowed to stay together, but were instead dispersed by bureaucratic fiat. Wherever we found ourselves, we found each other. We did our best to conjure up the culinary staples of our culture. But since we were dependent on Chinese markets, our food had an unacceptably Chinese tinge, another blow in the gauntlet of our humiliation that left us with the sweet and sour taste of unreliable <laughs> memories. Just correct enough to evoke the past, just wrong enough to remind us that the past was forever gone, missing along with the proper variety, subtlety, and complexity of our universal solvent, fish sauce. <laughs> oh, fish sauce. How we missed it. How nothing tasted right without it. This pungent liquid condiment of the darkest sepia hue was much denigrated by foreigners for its supposedly horrendous reek, <laughs> lending new meaning to the phrase, there's something fishy around here, <laughs> for we, were the fishy ones. We used fish sauce the way Transylvanian villagers wore cloves of garlic to ward off vampires. In our case, to establish a perimeter with those Westerners who could never understand that what was truly fishy was the nauseating stench of cheese. What was fermented fish compared to curdled milk? But out of deference to our hosts, we kept our feelings to ourselves sitting close to one another on prickly sofas and scratchy carpets, our knees touching under crowded kitchen tables, chewing on dried squid and the cud of remembrance, until our jaws ached, trading stories heard second and third hand about our scattered country. This was the way we learned of the clan turned into slave labor by a farmer in Modesto, and the naive girl who flew to Spokane to marry her GI sweetheart and was sold to a brothel and the widower with nine children who went out into a Minnesotan winter and lay down in the snow on his back with mouth open until he was buried and frozen, and the regretful refugees on Guam who petitioned to go back to Vietnam never to be heard from again, and the devout Buddhist who spanked his young son and was arrested for child abuse in Houston, and the husband who slapped his wife and was jailed for domestic violence in Raleigh, and the men who had escaped but left wives behind in the chaos, and the women who had escaped but left husbands behind, and the children who had escaped without parents and grandparents, and the families missing. One, two, three, 
or more children. Sifting through the dirt, we pan for gold, the story of the baby orphan adopted by a Kansas billionaire, or the mechanic who bought a lottery ticket in Arlington and became a multimillionaire, or the girl elected president of her high school class in Baton Rouge, or the boy accepted by Harvard from Fond du Lac, or the movie star you love so much, dear aunt, who circled the world from airport to airport, no country letting her in after the fall of Saigon, none of her American movie star friends returning her desperate phone calls until, with her last dime, she snagged Tippi Hedren, who flew her to Hollywood. So it was that we soaked ourselves in sadness and we rinsed ourselves with hope. And for all that we believed, almost every rumor we heard, almost all of us refused to believe that our nation was dead. So most of you in this room have no idea who Tippi Hedren is. <laughs> She's a famous movie star, movie called The Birds, Alfred Hitchcock, you should all watch it. And it is a true story. The famous Vietnamese movie star was Kip Jin. And Kip Hed Tippi Hedren came to Camp Pendleton and took such pity on the Vietnamese refugees that she encountered that she had a personal manicurist come to the camp and train some of these women in the arts of manicure. Which is how, over 40 years later, we Vietnamese people have come to take over 51% of the nail salon industry. That's either a pro-refugee story or an anti-refugee story. <laughs> I personally think it's a pro-refugee story. So we came here. And we pursued the American dream. My parents and Vietnamese women, also Vietnamese men, who became manicurists. But these refugees also as they pursued the American dream, brought with them these memories of war. And the memories of this war have been incredibly important to this country. Memories of war in general have been incredibly important to this country. It's only a couple of weeks ago that the anniversary of 9-11 passed. And there was a lot of commemoration about 9-11. And of course there should be commemoration about 9-11 for the 3,000 people who died and of everybody else, all the other American soldiers who died in the years afterwards. But there was a lot of forgetting taking place too, at the same time. Because I think very few Americans remember, care to remember, ever knew, how many Iraqis or Afghans or anybody else from the Middle East also died during these conflicts, during this war that is actually still happening today. And that is the experience that people from Vietnam or Laos or Cambodia have also endured the experience of remembering and forgetting at the same time. Because when Americans say the word Vietnam, what they usually mean is the Vietnam War. And when they say the Vietnam War, what they usually mean is the American War. Or in other words, what the war has meant for Americans, for the 58,000 plus American soldiers who died in the war, which is a tragedy. And for the civil war in the American soul that resulted as a course of this war in Vietnam. But most Americans have no idea that three million Vietnamese people died during this war, and that up to three million Laotians and Cambodians also died during the years of this war and afterwards. So remembering and forgetting happened at the same time whenever we talk about wars, and the Vietnamese themselves are guilty of that. The Vietnamese in Vietnam choose to forget the Vietnamese who fled, choose to forget what happened in Laos and Cambodia. The Vietnamese Americans here choose to forget what they might have done in Vietnam as well. So remembering and forgetting are part of any war that we engage in. And what also concerns me is the fact that when we think of war, whether we're Americans or anybody else, typically we think of soldiers, of men, of battles, tanks, airplanes, this kind of thing. But I grew up in this Vietnamese refugee community, surrounded by civilians as well, who had been impacted by this war by women, by children, who had all been shaped by this war. And so to me, it seems important that when we talk about war, we also talk about how war is not simply something that takes place on the battlefield, but war is something that involves men and women, children and civilians, Americans and others. It involves all of us. My former teacher, Maxine Han Kingston, wrote a book called Chinaman, in which she has a chapter called The Brother in Vietnam. And she says that this brother in Vietnam actually never fired a shot. He sat on a Navy ship in the middle of the ocean. But then she says, when she opened the door of her refrigerator, she opened something in which the coolant 
had been manufactured by the same companies that manufactured Agent Orange. The refrigerator and its components had been built by the same chains that had manufactured bombs for the bombing in Vietnam. Her point was that we're all implicated, but that it's much easier for us when we think of war to think of men and soldiers and battles and what happens over there versus thinking about what happens when we open the refrigerator. And that's very much part of my work, is to get us to think again about these connections between what happens here, what happens there, what we remember, what we forget, what we do as Americans and how it affects others. And so I teach a class on the Vietnam War and I have my students go out and interview survivors of the war. Here's what they find out. They interview American veterans and they discover that many of these American veterans have been deeply traumatized by the war, what they did, what was done to them. But they discover that a lot of American veterans have not been because they never fired a shot. They sat on a base, they sat on a boat, so on. They interview Southeast Asian refugees and they discover that every single one of these refugees has a traumatic story to tell. Because to be a refugee means that you've been traumatized. To, to make the escape, to make the journey to another country means you've been traumatized, you've been through a horrible experience. These to me are also war stories as well. And if we as Americans are to fully confront our responsibility and our role in the world, we need to understand our American wars as being something that involves more than just American soldiers and involves more than just Americans, but it involves everybody else who are impacted by these wars that we engage in. So these refugees are haunted by their past. I grew up in this Vietnamese refugee community surrounded by stories of loss and bitterness and pain and rage and melancholy because these people felt that they had lost a country. They felt that they had lost a war. They felt that they had lost people, identities, everything. So I grew up wanting to tell some of these stories and that's what led to this book called The Refugees, a short story collection. And I'll just read a, a couple pages from this book. But it's very much a, a book that is not just about Vietnamese refugees, because it, it has stories of people who are not Vietnamese refugees, but it is also about haunting, about how all refugees are constituted by their haunting. And so many of those who have been shaped by war, who have gone to war, remain haunted by their experiences. So this, uh, this opening story is called Black Eyed Women, and as you'll see, very much about ghosts. Fame, which strikes someone. Usually the kind that healthy-minded people would not wish upon themselves such as being kidnapped and kept prisoner for years, humiliated in a sex scandal, or surviving something typically fatal. These survivors needed someone to help write their memoirs, and their agents might eventually come across me. At least your name's not on anything, my mother once said. When I mentioned that I would not mind being thanked in the acknowledgments, she said, let me tell you a story. It would be the first time I heard this story, but not the last. In our homeland, she went on, there was a reporter who said the government tortured the people in prison. So the government does to him exactly what he said they did to others. They send them away and no one ever sees him again. That's what happens to writers who put their names on things. <laughs> By the time Victor Devoto chose me, I had resigned myself to being one of those writers whose names did not appear on book covers. His agent had given him a book that I had ghostwritten. It's ostensible author, the father of a boy who had shot and killed several people at his school. I identify with the father's guilt, Victor said to me. He was the sole survivor of an airplane crash, 173 others having perished, including his wife and children. What was left of him appeared on all the talk shows, his body there, but not much else. The voice was a soft monotone, and the eyes on the occasions they looked up seemed to hold within them the silhouettes of mournful people. His publisher said that it was urgent that he finish his story while audiences still remember the tragedy. And this was my preoccupation on the day my dead brother returned to me. My mother woke me while it was still dark outside and said, don't be afraid. Through my open door, the light from the hallway stunned. Why would I be afraid? When she said my brother's name, I did not think of my brother. He had died long ago. I closed my eyes and said, I did not know anyone by that name, but she persisted. He is here to see us, she said, stripping off my covers and tugging at me until I rose, eyes half shut. She was 63, moderately forgetful, and when she led me to the living room and cried out, I was not surprised. He was right here, she said, 
kneeling by her floor armchair as she felt the car. <coughs> it's wet. She crawled to the front door in her cotton pajamas following the trail. When I touched the carpet, it was damp. For a moment, I twitched in belief and the silence of the house at four in the morning felt ominous. Then I noticed the sound of rainwater in the gutters and the fear that it gripped my neck relaxed its hold. My mother must have opened the door, gotten drenched, then come back inside. I knelt by her as she crouched next to the door, her hand on the knob, and said, you're imagining things. I know what I saw. Brushing my hand off her shoulder, she stood up, anger illuminating her dark eyes. He walked. He talked. He wanted to see you. Then where is he, ma'am? I don't see anyone. Of course you don't, she sighed, as if I were the one unable to grasp the obvious. He's a ghost, isn't he? So I grew up in this community surrounded by what I felt to be ghosts. And this character is a ghost writer. She is speaking for people who don't want to have their names on books. She is speaking for these ghosts. And when the sympathizer came out, something happened that I, that I knew was going to happen that was related to this. And uh, that was that in the first major uh, review that the book got, which was a great review, the reviewer said in the second or third line, Viet is a voice for the voiceless. I was like, no! <laughs> Have you ever met any Vietnamese people? <laughs> Been to a Vietnamese house? A Vietnamese restaurant? Vietnam. We're really, really loud. <laughs> it's not that we're voiceless. It's just that we're not heard. And that is true for every minority you can speak of in this country or elsewhere. We're always speaking. We're always telling stories. But we're speaking in languages that our own children or our grandchildren can't can understand. Or we're speaking in languages that the dominant society can't understand. And even when we're telling stories in the dominant language, people still refuse to hear, still refuse to do the extra step of finding our stories. So, for example, last year something called, uh, this documentary uh, called The Vietnam War came out by Ken Burns and Lynn Nodder. 18 hour documentary. 18 hours about the Vietnam War. I saw 45 minutes in there's the deal. But when it came out, I refused to see all 18 hours. Because I knew if I did, I'd be asked, and I was asked, to go on TV, to go on radio, to talk about this show as the professional Vietnamese. <laughs> I also knew that when I was going to do these kinds of events in the few months after the documentary came out, I knew what was going to happen. What happened was at every single event, somebody would say, have you seen that documentary <laughs> called the Vietnam War? And my answer was, no. <laughs> Because, and I, asked, I, and I would always, I, what was always true was that the person who asked that question had not read a book by a Vietnamese person or seen a movie by Vietnamese people. And if you have 18 hours to watch another documentary about the Vietnam War from the American point of view, you have 18 hours to spare to read a book by a Vietnamese person. <laughs> That's the obstacle that we're, speak, that we're facing. Those of us who are called voiceless, even when we speak up. We're not her, even when we publish our books. There are literally dozens of books by Vietnamese American writers. And you don't have to know Vietnamese. They're written in English. <laughs> you can go on Google. I know you can go on Google. You can look up Vietnamese American literature. They're out there. But you have to take that step. So that's the obstacle we're facing. And for me, I'm someone who's really concerned ever since I was an undergraduate in school. I was always been, I've always been concerned with this question about justice. What is justice in our society? And one definition of justice, not the only definition, but one definition of justice is that a just society elevates the voices of all the voiceless. A just society doesn't elevate just one voice to be the spokesperson for the voiceless. And that's why when you hear someone being called the voice for the voiceless, and it's been used not just with me, but almost any writer who comes from minority population, it's not meant as a compliment. I think people think it's a compliment, but it's not a compliment. What it really means is that dominant society doesn't want to hear from everybody. They just want to hear from one person to make it easy for them. But our job is not to make it easy for them. Our job is to transform our societies so that everybody has a voice, everybody can be heard.
And when I was in high school, calling myself a part of the Asian invasion, what I didn't really understand was that I needed more voices. I needed more stories. I needed more voices and more stories from immigrants, from refugees, from Asian Americans, from people of color, from queer people, from trans people, from any kind of minority in this country. But I didn't have that. Because we lived, and we still do to some extent, in an economy of narrative scarcity. Narrative scarcity is when there are very few stories about you. And you know you're a member of the majority when almost all the stories are about you. When almost all the stories are about you, one bad story doesn't matter. There's a bad movie out there about white people, doesn't matter. There's a million other movies about white people out there. But when Crazy Rich Asians comes out, everybody freaks out. We got one movie about Asians, it better be good. That's the dilemma that we're facing. That's what narrative scarcity means. Narrative scarcity also extends to those of us who are immigrants or refugees within our own families. I don't know how common this is for you, but I grew up in a family in which mom and dad didn't tell a lot of stories about the past. They told me what they wanted me to know, and they withheld a lot of other information. So for example, we came here, four of us, as refugees, but the fifth one didn't make it. I had an adopted sister, 16 years old. I had no memories of her, because I was four when I left. My father had one black and white wallet-sized photograph of her. So I knew her face, I knew her name, and that's about all I knew. So that's what I mean by saying that I feel like I grew up haunted. That there was an absent presence in my house. Someone should have been there who was not there. Someone who was not really talked about. That narrative scarcity was in our own household. And in so many households of refugees and immigrants, which is another reason why we need to tell our stories. It's one of the reasons why I became a writer, because I feel so passionately about the importance of stories. That sign in the shop window, another American driven out of business by the Vietnamese, was not simply a sign of nine words. It was an entire story. And what I didn't realize at the time was that it was an old story. And it was a powerful story. The real story is another American driven out of business by fill in the blank. And before us, there had been the Chinese, and then the Japanese, and then the Filipinos, and then the Chinese again, and then the Mexicans, and then pretty much anybody from Central America, and then it was our turn, and then it was the Japanese, and now it's the Chinese and the North Koreans. Another American driven out of business by fill in the blank is an old, old story meant to create fear of these newcomers, of these others. And I was an other who was wanting to tell our stories. Because I knew that another American driven out of business by fill in the blank was a story that was being told by people who were not storytellers. I'm a professional storyteller. But all of us are storytellers in the sense that when we go home, or when we go back to our dorm rooms, or we go back to our apartments, we tell stories about who we are, about what this country is, about what our society is. And some people will say, another American driven out of business by fill in the blank. So we have responsibilities as storytellers. We have a responsibility to know that we are telling these kinds of stories. And we have a responsibility to change those stories. We can't change this country until we change the stories that we tell about this country. And I believe that we need, to, we need to tell stories about an America that builds bridges instead of walls. I believe that we need to tell stories about an America that opens its heart instead of closes its mind. <laughs> 
I believe that we need to tell stories like these every day to ourselves, to others, to anybody who is willing to listen. You and me, we're all storytellers of our own story and of America's as well. Thank you. It just means I get to go to the bar earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. If not, I'm in. 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 i my question to you today is, how do you stay so humble? You talk about America as if nothing really bad happened to you. My parents struggle with that whole intensity of what happened to their country. And for them to come over here and not really talk about it at home, they, they are, they're also humble about the whole experience. Yet for me, as being a child, I'm not knowing, I, you know, it's very frustrating hear these stories because you know, I see it home every day. So. No, I, I totally feel what you're saying because part of the reason why the, uh, immigrants and refugees of the first generation who come here don't want to talk out loud about their stories outside of their household, even and sometimes even not with, with, with even within their own household, <laughs> is because they're they're afraid of a few things. They're afraid of being deported. They're afraid of being targeted as others, even if they're here in a documented way. But I think they're also afraid of reliving what they've been through. It's one of the reasons why I didn't always press my parents about what has happened in the past. And I'll ask them certain questions, and they'll, they'll tell me the same stories over and over, and I just feel like, well, they don't want to tell me. It's not my place to keep pushing them to tell me about what happened. Because what if what happened was something really terrible? Do they want to relive this experience? Do they want to pass it on to you or me? Maybe they're trying to protect us as well. But when the community as a whole doesn't speak out, I think one of the reasons why is because besides fear, there's also the expectation of gratitude. Like these refugees who have come over, I'll speak about what I know about from Vietnam, for example, a lot of them feel a burden of gratitude to the United States for taking them in. And that's a genuine gratitude because the United States didn't have to take in 130,000 refugees and then hundreds of thousands more later. That's something we should be grateful for. But should we be grateful for being bombed? Okay? The United States dropped more bombs on Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War than on all of Europe during World War II. To me, these two realities are completely contradictory and completely normal in American history at the same time. To bomb a country and then to rescue its people. <laughs> because it allows the United States to say, we're not so bad. We took refugees in, unlike these communist countries, for example. But this is a central contradiction of American society. It goes back to our very origins of a country that was built on genocide and slavery and so on, and occupation, and yet a country that also allows a democracy and freedom of speech and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's the central contradiction of this country that we all grapple with as Americans. It's being played out every day, today, for example, in our society. So our challenge as Americans is to tell a complex story. I, and if you read my books, they're, com they're, they're a little bit more complex. You know, I mean, they, they actually get pretty angry. They get so angry that I get letters from sometimes from some Americans saying, go back to where you came from. <coughs> because they want a simple story. They want the simple story that America is great. Or maybe America was great, we've got to make it great again. <laughs> But my story is, well, America could be great. And America has been great sometimes. But America's been pretty awful other times, too. These two things have always existed simultaneously. And it's difficult, I think, for first-generation refugees and immigrants to bring that up. It's up to us to do so if they haven't done it. Okay, wonderful. And just to remind the audience, if you would like to purchase those books that 
was just mentioned. The bookstore is at the front left hand corner of the room. They will be leaving here at 7.30. So if you want to purchase a book, please do it right now. We have a question right there. I actually have two questions. So first, um, um, now that your book won the Pulitzer Prize, um, do you see a movie coming out of it? And also, um, hey, it's And also, um, what did your parents think when you wrote the book? Like, what were their thought of it? writing the histories and everything. So uh, in terms of a movie, you know, my, uh, yeah, I went to the dance and all that with producers and actors and everything. And, and everything. Um, but my ambition was always a TV series because when I was writing The Sympathizer, it was uh, 2011 to 2013. And for the whole decade before 2011, I had not watched any TV. Okay? Just too busy. 2011 to 2013, I had a lot of time off to write the novel. And I spent the entire two years watching all the TV series that I had missed out on, like The Wire, Breaking Bad, um, <laughs> Sopranos, <laughs> Mad Men, and that, that structure totally influences the novel. So my, my editor, when he, when he got the novel, he was like, did you realize that every single chapter is the same length? Like, well, of course, because that's, that's the point, you know, it's the TV. So, you know, uh, we'll see. I mean, I have a producer, I have a, a director, hopefully, but now we've got to go and try to sell this thing. My parents. Well, I mean, first of all, I don't think they realized I was writing anything. <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had very conservative parents, which is not a surprise, but they were liberal in one respect, which is that they allowed me to be an English major as an undergraduate and an ethnic studies major. But there was no way I was going to go home to my mom and dad and say, who are working 12 to 14 hour days as refugee shopkeepers, and say, hey, mom and dad, I'm, I want to study the romantic poets. <laughs> I love the romantic poets, but I cannot tell them I was doing that. So I became a big PhD, I became a professor, but I kept it kind of, you know, quiet what I was doing, and they didn't really, they didn't really know, they didn't really understand either. So that was hard enough for them to understand that I was an English professor. I never told them I was a writer. You know? One time, I came home, and I brought my dad a Vietnamese translation of one of my short stories from the refugees. It's called The, uh, the Other Man. It's about a Vietnamese refugee in 1975 who comes to San Francisco and finds out he's gay. The story isn't Vietnamese. My dad never mentioned it to me again. <laughs> so I, I didn't feel the need to tell him anymore. I, I bring home my books, I show them to him, uh, for my parents. They're very proud. They, 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 they take pictures of the book and they put it in, on their shelf. They never read it. <laughs> well, a surprise happens, enormously proud. Which is pretty much like, I think, a lot of other Vietnamese people. I, I think most Vietnamese people have not read the book, but they all love the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I'm glad to do that for them. Hi, my name is Ben. Um, I'm a child of refugees too, and I was wondering, for myself, when I first came to the U.S., you know, it was hard to, for me to learn how to embrace my Vietnamese. And I was wondering how that process was like for you. Um, it was very difficult, you know, because I, I grew up uh, feeling like I was, in, uh, I was split in two. You know? In my parents' very Vietnamese household, I was an American spying on them. And then when I went out into the American world, the rest of the American world, I felt like I was a Vietnamese spying on these Americans, right? And so, of course, you know, when you're growing up this way, it's very common to not to want to deny your vietnamese or whatever your, your identity happens to be. And I struggled with it, you know, like, for example, I came at four years old, no one kind of speak Vietnamese. Um, by the time I was 11 or 12, I'd forgotten most of it. You know, I, I, and, and, and so, I, I, but I was, I was always curious about it as well. I just, I wasn't curious about it in the way that my parents wanted me to be curious about it. You know, my parents were dev are devout Catholic people. Okay? They wanted two things for me when I was growing up. They wanted me to have a good education and to be a good Catholic. They got one out of two. They tried to teach me how to be Vietnamese by being Catholic, and I thought it's not working for me. Um, so when, it, when, when I was old enough, you know, probably your age or something like that, when I was in college, I just made the effort. And I, thankfully, I, was, I went to a university that's probably sort of like this, you know, UC Berkeley, very diverse, very progressive, and so on. And so there's a lot of support for that. You can look at an audience like this and see many, many different kinds of faces, many, many different kinds of stories. And so I just, I taught myself. I read everything I could about Vietnamese, the Vietnam War, Vietnamese culture, the world, what was available in English. But I have to say that I think it's been sort of a lifelong project to get back in touch with my Vietnamese-ness, whatever that means. And part of the problem, and this is probably true for a lot of other minority or ethnic or cultural communities, is that people will try to impose definitions on you. When I was growing up, people would say, you're not really Vietnamese. 
And you can't speak Vietnamese. I go back to Vietnam, even today, I will speak Vietnamese in Vietnam, and, and people are like, you, people think I'm Korean. <laughs> really good Vietnamese for a Korean. You know? So people are always trying to impose new definitions of authentic identity on you. I grew up, I was, I, I, I was so done with that. Whether you're Vietnamese or whatever, whatever other identity you might happen to be, or whether you're American, there's no one single way of being Vietnamese or being American. We each make our own identity, right? And so that's part, you know, that's part of what I'm trying to say. Like all of us are struggling to make this American identity together so that we can accommodate all the millions of people who have different backgrounds. And likewise with being Vietnamese, we should be allowed to be the Vietnamese person that we are, even as we're curious about what other people's definition of being Vietnamese is. So I wish you good luck on that journey. <laughs> Hi. So the question is more of a personal nature. I'm Vietnamese also, and it took my father literally about 20 years of my life for him to finally talk about the war. So how did you get your parents to actually talk about, you know, what happened to them? Because to this day, like one day in my entire 35 years of life that my dad talked to me for two hours, because we were on a trip to drive from Toronto back to Windsor, Canada. And that was the only time in my entire life my dad would ever talk to me what happened during the war. And when I ask him or my mom, they never say anything. So like, how did you overcome that and talk to your parents? I mean, my parents were willing to tell me some stories, but they're always the same stories. So I have about half a dozen or 10 stories about life in Vietnam uh, from the 1940s to the 1970s. My parents were born in the 1930s in North Vietnam. They were Catholics. And unfortunately, what that means is that when you're born in the 1930s in Vietnam, you're gonna you're looking at, at four decades of really difficult experience ahead of you. So they would the five, the six or ten stories that they that they told me were all terrible stories. Okay? And uh, that's what I mean when I said that I didn't feel like I would I you know I would ask them beyond these stories and they wouldn't tell me anything. So I felt like the stories they told me were horrible enough, right? And so I, I didn't really know whether there was even worse things that they weren't telling me or whether these were the things that simply imprinted themselves up, up upon them the most, but they never gave me a complete story. So they were a little bit more forthcoming than your father, but they never gave me the complete story. Even to this day, you know, I've asked my dad, you want to record your life story? He said, don't really want to do it. Um, it's so, it varies. I met Vietnamese people like you, whose parents refused to talk about the past. A, a, a much smaller portion of people whose parents do want to talk about the past. And there's no single answer to it, unfortunately. And I'm, and I'm sorry. And that's part of the difficulty of being uh, part of the second generation of uh, descended from refugees and from immigrants who've had difficult experiences. Hi, Professor. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for coming today. Uh, you probably hear this a lot, but I was super mesmerized uh, by the rich complexity of your writing. It just really, I just was completely enamored. Um, so I have a two-pronged question. Uh, the first is this. So like America has often been labeled as like the world's policeman. We infiltrate probably where, we, where influence isn't welcome. Um, I'm reminded specifically of Khmer Rouge um, and our complicity in the sort of rise in Cambodia. Um, and you talk about the use of stories to build bridges and portray America as a sort of place um, that seeks to build wall, uh, build bridges about the, you know, uh, produce or like erect walls. Um, so my first question is this, how do we talk about military infiltration and intervention and its long-lasting effects without drifting or devolving into a sort of condemnation of the U.S. and uh, political propaganda? And my second question is the idea of like narrative scarcity and also the pitfalls of ethical memory that you talk about in your scholarly work. Um, it's so hard to pinpoint who's like the ethical one and who's the unethical one. I mean, even you mentioned the attitudes of, um, of segregation even among refugees. Um, in the sympathizer, obviously the South Vietnamese soldiers are forced to leave behind their families, but even I question how ethical that really is. So then, how then is that representation of, um, it, like, better than a Ken Burns documentary? So my second question is this, um, what's more important, winning the physical war or the war of representation? You get an A. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so, you know, I, I, so for example, you know, I teach that class on the Vietnam War, and I actually get, you know, quite a few students who are military. You know, they, 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 they're, they're cadets, they're preparing for war, 
or they've come back. And I feel it is, I, mean, I make it very, I think it's kind of clear when I, when I teach that class, you know, what my conception of war is. It's different from the typical military conception of war. Um, I, you know, when I, when I teach that course, I talk about not just American experiences, but about Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Lotion experiences. And so what I'm trying to do there is, is to engage with the military in an ethical way. And in fact, I'm supposed to go to West Point in the spring to talk to, talk to the entire plebe or freshman class. And the point for me to go there is not to condemn, even though I disagree with many of the wars that the United States have engaged in, and even the role of the United States as the world's policeman, where it has, we have 800 plus military bases in foreign countries. That's, that's part of what it means to be American. It's not just the wars, individual wars that we go out to fight, but this fact that since World War II, we have this global presence, which has consumed a very significant part of our, of our infrastructure. And so that's, I think we can have a conversation there. I don't think I have to go there and pander to the military or to condemn the military. I can acknowledge that there are many, 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 many honorable people who serve in the military and who are patriots. But that's different from simply saying that we are going to stand with America regardless of what America is doing. And I think that uh, intelligent and humane and ethical military people can understand that too. That gets to the question of ethics. What is, what is ethical memory? What is ethical behavior, right? Because one of the things I talk about in my work is that what made the Vietnam War a tragedy was not that there was one side who was right and one side who was wrong. What made it a tragedy was that everybody believed that they were right. And as a result, everybody did terrible things. You can document the atrocities that were committed by all sides in the Vietnam War. So where is ethical memory or where is ethical behavior in that situation? Um, and it's very difficult because I grew up in this Vietnamese refugee community where the only way to speak out in public about the Vietnam War was to say, you're anti-communist. And eventually I had to decide that there is an ethical dimension to this. Because if you live in the United States, the United States basically just, for the most part, for 30, 40 years, wanted to ignore, forget, erase Vietnamese points of view. And to the extent that Americans cared about Vietnamese points of view, they cared about the enemy. They didn't care about the refugees who were in the United States. So for Vietnamese refugees to assert their own, their own story is ethical for them. Because if we, if we don't remember ourselves, who will? But the problem is that a lot of Vietnamese uh, refugees who tell these stories then obviously erase the memories of others. So the question of being ethical it's constantly before us, and the resolution that I, that I get to in Nothing Ever Dies, I'll just summarize it for you. You know, 14 years of agonizing thinking in 30 seconds. <laughs> the resolution is, for me, when we talk about war, the necessity to acknowledge our own capacity for inhumanity. Because typically when we talk about war, what we do is we say, okay, the, us versus them, we're human, they're inhuman. The next step beyond that is to say, oh, well, the war's over, we're human, they're human too. Or the anti-war movement says, they're human, we're inhuman. Okay, these are all different kinds of ethical models. But we're all, if we're all human, what that really means is that we're all inhuman, both our enemies and ourselves. If you look at any war, if you look past propaganda, you're gonna find that all sides did terrible things. That doesn't prevent us from asking questions of responsibility. Who is responsible for a war? That's different. But it does allow us to say, once we get ourselves into a war, to be ethical means to acknowledge that we ourselves have also done terrible things too. And, and unless we can acknowledge that, we are actually never going to be able to reconcile with our former enemies. As long as we believe we were right, we are never going to be able to acknowledge our own responsibility, our own culpability, and to address our past. Which is how, 150 years later, we're still debating the Civil War. Yeah. That war is not solved ethically. There's no reason to expect that the Vietnam War or that any more recent conflicts have been resolved by us either. All right, so we have one final question from a student scholar here, and then we will start our book signing.
we have to be cognizant of the space, we have to be cognizant of the thought. So, one final question by Stephen Scott. Hi, Professor. I just wanted to thank you so much. I just wanted to thank you for the, uh, for the talk you gave tonight. I uh, just want to share quickly my perspective. So, uh, as an Asian American myself, I don't actually often think about the refugee crisis or these experiences. I often, uh, I would used to think really that you know, America was a greater country. Of course, we have a little bit of improvement here and there, but um, I was not even aware of the refugee crisis or the immigration crises that we've had until recently when my sister's been assigned um, a lot of, uh, to write a lot of articles. Uh, regarding uh, Vietnamese, the, the Vietnamese refugee crisis and also uh, Cambodian uh, detainees. Uh, so that kind of brought to light um, a lot of uh, these issues. Uh, she would have really enjoyed your talk tonight. I uh, wish she was here. I didn't really know that we were going to be attending this, but um, I'm really grateful that we got to, I got to hear this. Um, but I just want to know if you've ever had a discussion with uh, racist or white supremacist. I'm just curious uh, what your experiences were regarding those discussions or if there's a common theme, if you often or um, occasionally have those discussions. You know, I think it's interesting that um, I have rarely had that. Whereas I know, you know, some Asian American women, for example, who post their articles online, and these articles are no less controversial or critical than my own, and they report being swamped by racist and sexist comments. So I think there is something about me being a man, maybe, that helps to insulate me, me being a Pulitzer Prize winner, maybe, that helps to insulate me from the worst of his stuff. And the critical comments that I get, uh, I don't know whether they're white supremacists or whether they're just racist. Um, there's a distinction between, there's a gradation of behavior and belief, you know. Um, and, you know, for example, when the novel came out, Synthesizer came out, I published an op-ed in the New York Times about the scars that refugees carry. I got an email from a, an American veteran, enlisted man, he was so angry. We sacrificed for you, you should be grateful. And so, I don't know if that was racist. I assume there was a little bit of racism in there. I wrote back to him, I said, you know, the only person you're, 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 you're affecting with your anger is you. You're making yourself feel even worse. You should try to find some reconciliation. He wrote me back an even angrier email. <laughs> so that started to wear me down. Sometime later, I got a letter, a letter from someone who was quite educated, dentist, doctor, former military officer, American veteran, and in much longer, a longer letter, in a much more polite way, he said the same thing. And he said, you seem to love Vietnam so much, why don't you go back and take your son with you? That's racist. It's very nice racism, from a, I'm sure, very, very nice man. It's still racism. I should have written him back. I was just so tired. <laughs> and I, you know, so, so I think it's absolutely crucial, obviously, to, that's why I'm going to these different audiences, I'm willing to go anywhere, almost, almost, <laughs> to engage with people. But when we talk about building bridges instead of building walls, we have to understand, you build a bridge, people don't have to cross it. Like, it shouldn't stop us from building bridges. But that's only half the work that needs to be done. Thank you, Cal State LA. If you all would like to get a book signed, here is how it's going to work. Here is how.